Well, I wanted to start out by giving everyone a little bit of a fair warning. Uh, my political training has been to speak as concisely and briefly as possible. However, you all asked for somewhat of a longer presentation tonight, so I'm going to do my best. I want to thank Kyle for inviting me out here. Uh, you know, I, this, I think this organization is spectacular. The fact that youth are getting together, we're getting together and discussing revolutionary ideas on our free time is a really tremendous development. The older generation of revolutionary activists have certainly made a tremendous contribution to the struggle for justice, but it's our turn now. And uh, I also want to thank someone and, and acknowledge someone who, who uh, I had the pleasure of working with at Montclair State, and that's Mav. Now, Mav is a dynamic individual. Uh, you know, he has a lot of skills in organizing, but there's one particular attribute of Mav I, I want to highlight. Uh, Mav is from Syria, his family is from Syria. And uh, if Mav were the kind of person that just wanted to be popular and just wanted to fit in, he could be doing things a lot differently. He could be going around saying things like, Assad is a brutal dictator, and uh, my family lived under it. And if he said these things, he would be embraced by this system. Math has principles. Math may not be a huge fan of the Syrian government as it currently exists, but he knows what's going on. He knows that right now, the United States, in alliance with Saudi Arabia, Israel, and other US-aligned regimes throughout the region, is pouring billions and billions of dollars into an armed campaign of violent terrorism designed to tear apart Syria. All across the country, schools, churches, mosques, and highways are being bombed. Our tax dollars are, using, are being used to promote a campaign of terrorism. The intention is to bring down the Syrian Arab Republic, a country where religious groups, Christians, Sunnis, and Alawites have been living in relative peace for the last few decades, and replace it with a government that's far more friendly to Wall Street, Tel Aviv, and the London Stock Exchange. Now, many of the anti-government fighters in Syria aren't even from Syria. There are many, there are many of them are from places like Jordan, Libya, Afghanistan, and even as far away as Malaysia, and they've been shipped in. Now, our leaders tell us they want to fight ISIS, but in 2014, 50% of the so-called Free Syrian Army actually defected to join ISIS. Over 200,000 Syrians are already dead, and millions have become refugees. The U.S. continues to pour money into this violent campaign of destruction, keeping this war going. Now, for Maff to stand with his country and speak the truth about what the imperialists are doing is a brave and heroic thing, and it's not easy to do here in the United States. For being, an, for being honest about the reality of the situation facing his country and speaking the truth about things that aren't popular to say here in the United States, Maff and many other Syrians, patriotic Syrians here in the United States, like the Syrian American Forum, which organizes here in New Jersey, have my absolute and utmost respect. Since 2008, there's been a lot of talk about capitalism in this country, finally. For a long time, it was a word you couldn't say, but now it's back in the, the discourse. You can talk about capitalism. Polls are coming out showing that people don't like capitalism. Why? Because capitalism is proving itself to be a disaster. Even in this country, supposedly the richest country in the world, there are millions of homeless people. And for every homeless person in the United States, there are 20 empty housing units. While many of our bridges are not secure, our water isn't being purified, our streets are crumbling, our education system is in shambles, there are millions and millions of skilled, hardworking people who don't even have a job. And a lot of them are youth. So many young people, full of potential to make the world a better place and improve people's lives, are left idle. In capitalism, things only get done if a capitalist can make money off of it. And because the capitalists can't make money off of their labor, there are millions of young people who are unemployed. And even people who are working have it pretty rough. You know, they've got this term now, they talk about the working poor. Why should so many people who are working 40-hour work weeks every week, you know, be worried about feeding their kids and paying their bills? It's ridiculous. I remember when I was living in Cleveland, right after college, I had a job at a gas station. And on Fridays, I had the day off, I used to go down to the plasma center and, and sell my blood plasma, you know, get an extra 50, 60 bucks. And you know, the people who went there to, to sell their blood plasma, they weren't drug addicts and homeless people. There were, there were mothers there with kids. They would wake, take turns watching each other's kids while they would go in and have their veins pumped so they'd get an extra 50 or 60 bucks, you know? The west side of Cleveland where I was living, uh, you know, this used to be the center of the steel production. I mean, it was a booming center of steel production. But the steel mills are closed down, and now it's a very impoverished area. But you can go a little even closer to home. You go here in, here in New Jersey, Secaucus. Secaucus used to be the home of a pig processing plant, one of the biggest pig processing plants in the country, 
where thousands of people were employed. They got made union wages, union representation on the job to, to work at a pig processing plant. That pig processing plant is closed down. What do they have in Secaucus now? They've got the biggest Walmart in New Jersey, where people are, st are working there making less than $10 an hour. So what is capitalism? Capitalism is a system in which the banks, the factories, the land, and other centers of economic power are the private property of owners. In capitalism, you don't have houses so people can live in them. Rather, you have housing so landlords and bankers can make money from it. You don't have food so people can eat it. You have food so agribusiness and the big box stores can make money off of it. The way Frederick Engels put it, the means of production only function as preliminary transformation into capital. Or you can go with it more simply the way Mao Zedong put it. He said, profits are in command. In capitalism, the workers, those of us who don't own any banks or factories or oil wells or big box stores, we have to sell our labor power to a boss in order to survive. The bosses then use our labor power to make profits. The overwhelming majority of the human race are workers who live by working. And it's only a small group of people who are the owners who live by owning and turning the work that we do uh, into their profits. But the capitalism of today is not ordinary capitalism. We currently live under capitalism in its highest monopoly stage. In the 21st century, it is the wealthy capitalists of Wall Street, London, Berlin, Frankfurt, Paris, and other Western countries that control the world economy. These billionaire bankers don't just make ordinary profits, they make super profits, sucking in wealth from almost the entire world. And all around the world, in places like Africa, Asia, Latin America, the Middle East, the workers there, they aren't just exploited, but they're super exploited. This is the globalized form of capitalism, and it's called imperialism. If you want to understand imperialism, let's talk about Nigeria. Now, Nigeria is actually one of the richest countries in the world. It currently exports more oil than any other African country. Nigeria has natural gas and iron ore and coal. It has a population of over 170 million people from a variety of different eth ethnic groups and nationalities. And in addition to that, there's a huge amount of arable land in Nigeria. In 2013, more than 11% of the oil that was imported into the United States actually came from Nigeria. Nigeria is this vastly rich country, but the people of Nigeria are very poor. According to the CIA World Factbook, I love to use their own statistics against them. You know, it's all on the internet. You can read this. It's the CIA World Factbook. They lay it all out there. CIA World Factbook reports that the life expectancy of the average person in Nigeria is 52 years old. 61% of adults in Nigeria are illiterate, and they have no formal education. 29% of Nigerians between the age of 5 and 14 work as child laborers. So why are the people in Nigeria, the country that's so rich, why are they so poor? Because control of Nigeria's vast wealth, its mineral wealth, its oil resources, its natural gas, it's not in the hands of Nigerians, it's in the hands of Shell Oil, a Dutch Wall Street oil corporation. When oil is sucked out of Nigeria and refined, Nigerians don't, don't make profits, Wall Street bankers do. And the same goes for the Middle East, you know, in Saudi Arabia, Oman, Bahrain, many countries in that region, there's plenty of oil. But all throughout the Middle East, people are starving and going without basic necessities and living in extreme poverty. And the world hasn't always been this way. They like to tell us, they like to give us the impression these countries around, around the impoverished parts of the world, they've always just been that way. But prior to Spanish colonialism, the people of Latin America had vast, strong civilizations like the Aztecs or the Incas. Uh, the Middle East is often called the cradle of civilization. You know, it's where civilization began while Europe was in the so-called Dark Ages. You know, Europe, Europe, uh, Europe was, you know, having I mean, medieval times, knights and castles and whatnot. The, the Middle Age, the, 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 the Middle East was the center of the world economy. You know, it was under, under the leadership of people inspired by the Prophet Muhammad, amazing things were, were going on. You know, Africa, that's, that's, the, that's the place where the pyramids were built, you know, and huge breakthroughs in astronomy took place. Uh, Bangladesh was once called Sonar Bengal, or the Golden Bangladesh, and it was because the silk and the fabric produced in Bangladesh was one of the most treasured and expensive items in the world. But today, the people in Bangladesh are starving. Recently, hundreds of Bangladeshis were burned alive in factory fires. The Golden Bangladesh is gone, and Bangladeshis get paid pennies an hour sewing, sewing clothes together for Walmart, Gap, and American Apparel. Capitalism in its global monopoly stage, led by big bankers, is not developing the world. 
The reason people all across the world are poor and getting poorer is because global monopoly capitalism beats people down and destroys civilizations in order to make sure that Wall Street keeps control of the planet. And when any country tries to break out of imperialism and tries to take control of its own economy, what is the result? Sanctions, war, death, and destruction. Gaddafi, he led Libya using the Libyan oil to develop the Libyan economy, supporting revolutionaries around the world like the Irish Republican Army, you know, received support from Gaddafi as well as the Black Panthers and many others. So what was done? You know, U.S. and NATO bombs, sanctions, and eventually the destruction. You know, now Libya is basically in a state of ruin. You know, their oil exports are down to 11% of what they were before. The country's been wrecked. They used to have the most efficient water system in the entire African continent of, of water transport. It's a very dry, desertous country. That's all been destroyed. Uh, the Taliban in Afghanistan refused to obey the orders of Wall Street. Now Afghanistan is also in chaos and civil war. Nowhere have the imperialists ever created stability or peace when they've attacked a country. And why is that? Because their intention isn't to create stability or peace. Their intention with sanctions, bombs, invasions, and other acts of aggression is not to make the world more secure. It's to destroy any competitors and make sure that they stay on top of it. You really have to think of it like this. Have you ever heard the expression, all roads lead to Rome? Well, that refers to the fact that back in the time of the Roman Empire, if you wanted to build a road, it had to be a road that was owned by the Romans. You couldn't build a road from one section of the empire to another. All roads led to Rome, and that was so that the Romans could, if, if you were on one of those roads, you had to pay a toll to them. Nothing went on in their empire that didn't result in them making profits from it. In the modern world, all roads lead to Wall Street. One country that is hated and demonized by the imperialists right now is the Islamic Republic of Iran. Before 1979, Iran was actually run by a brutal dictator called the Shah. The Shah tortured people, and he happily did whatever the U.S. and British oil companies wanted. But Iran had a revolution, and since 1979, Iranian oil has been in the hands of the people. Iran is developing independently, and so now Wall Street and the, their Israeli allies are doing all they can to isolate and attack Iran. But imperialism is not just a disaster in the third world. Even here at home, it is a nightmare. Imperialism has eliminated the so-called middle class of well-paid industrial workers that once existed in this country and replaced the Cold War economic setup, the American dream, you know, the house and the, you know, the picket fence and the kids and the car. They've replaced that with a low-wage service sector economy. All across Ohio, Michigan, and California, homes are foreclosed. Young people like us who've been told all our lies that if you just work hard, you'll get rich. We're facing instead a lifetime of low wages, short-term employment, and student debt. It's the same big banks like J.P. Morgan, Chase, Bank of America. They're getting rich uh, off exploiting people in Africa and Asia, and they've, they've also established a racket, a ripoff. You know, forcing young people to spend decades in debt for doing something that's basic, something that's free in most countries around the world, getting an education. As the world system of imperialism spirals downward, there is a rising police state. Police are everywhere, stopping and frisking people, bullying children in the hallways of their schools, kicking down people's doors in the middle of the night with SWAT teams. In order to make sure we accept the destruction of the so-called American way of life, they are turning toward a giant, they're turning, essentially turning the country into a giant low-wage prison. And for black and brown people in the United States, it's pretty much always been that way. During slavery, there weren't even any wages. Black people in the United States were bought, brought here in chains, and they've never been treated as equal members of this society. They've always been the last hired and the first fired. They faced lynch mobs, and now police officers are murdering them left and right and getting away with it. I'm going to take a drink of water here. Did I? Oh. Uh. <clears throat> and the situation for Chicanos and Latinos is not much different. The southwestern United States was forcibly stolen from Mexico, and now the people who have always lived there are criminalized and repressed. Imperialism has created a crisis of mass migration. Peoples from Latin America pour into the United States, desperately trying to earn back a little bit of the wealth that was stolen from their countries. And when they get here, they live in the shadows, always fearing deportation and getting paid poverty wages. But even beyond the oppressed nationalities and beyond the youth who are stuck in low-wage jobs, even in the more privileged sectors of US society, life is hardly a paradise. The imperialist billionaires who run this country promote a twisted culture of selfishness and me-first philosophy. The imperialists encourage people to try and act like them and get ahead by pushing someone else down. Women in the United States face the highest rates of sexual assault and rape of any country in the world. 
The rates of child abuse and domestic violence are equally astounding. There is no form of bigotry, degradation, hum or humiliation that is too shallow for the imperialists. Racism, sexism, anti-immigrant bigotry, hatred for Muslims, demonization of lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender people, exploitation and mistreatment of the disabled, attacks on people with a different gender expression, or people who just look different in some way. These are all ugly realities of a society run in order to make profits, controlled by bankers and billionaires. What is needed now more than ever is conscious resistance. Now, what is conscious resistance? Now, there's always been resistance of the oppressed against the oppressors. Slavery in this country was met with constant slave revolts. Native people heroically fought back against white settlers who tried to exterminate them. Workers have formed unions and gone out on strike. As much as anti-communists like to lecture us about human nature, one continuing aspect of the human experience is the resistance to oppression. If you push on people long enough, eventually they push back. That's just the way the world is. But not all resistance is conscious resistance. Often people fighting back, uh, it can just be an act of desperation or rage. Uh, people, people have been, you know, there's been a particularly outrageous expression of oppression and people pour into the streets and there's, there's a, a real rage that comes out. But conscious resistance, this is resistance that's carried out strategically with a goal in mind. Conscious resistance is resistance led by forces who know exactly what they are fighting against and what they are fighting for. It involves the oppressed and the exploited fighting back with the intention of not just changing their circumstances, but overturning oppressive relations. The ideology of communism or Marxism-Leninism is the science of conscious resistance, fighting the oppressors with the intention of winning and building a new world without oppression and suffering. Conscious resistance has entered human history fairly recently and it has a, had a tremendous effect on the impact and development of the human race, especially over the course of the last two centuries. There have been three stages of conscious resistance in history. I, I've come to refer to them as the three eras of communist revolution. And I'm going to briefly go over them and point out the key lessons uh, that they have for revolutionary fighters in the current period. The first stage of conscious resistance, the first era of communist revolution, took place in the 1800s, as capitalism was be still becoming the dominant system in the world, replacing feudalism. This period involved workers forming unions for the first time ever, going out on strike and demanding better working conditions. It involved Irish people struggling for their liberation against British rule. It involved anti-colonial struggles in Latin America and the Caribbean. In the year of 1848, there were revolts all across Europe. They called it the Spring of Nations. Revolts took place in France, Italy, Austria, Hungary, you name it. The revolt in Germany involved a faction called the Communist League. And that league actually published a document to put forward what they believed, and that was called the Communist Manifesto. The two ideological leaders who best incarnated and expressed the ideas that drove this particular period of, of resistance were called Karl Marx and Frederick Engels. They were the founders of the Communist League. They eventually went into exile. Uh, they expressed an understanding that the kings and queens of old Europe were being replaced by the factory owners and the businessmen. And they understood that this new system of capitalism had to be overthrown, just like the older system of feudalism had been. They put these events in, in the context of history gradually marching forward based on material conditions. Marx and Engels formed the International Workers Association, also called the First International. In 1871, uh, the workers in Paris actually overthrew the capitalists, and they created the Paris Commune. And for two months, the workers actually held power. It was the first example of what scientific revolutionaries call the dictatorship of the proletariat. Now, I know a lot of you have seen, you know, it's, it's common now, people, you know, salute each other with the fist, right? We've seen that. It's a common thing for revolutionaries to do. That actually comes from the Paris Commune. In 1871, after holding power for about two months, when the, when the, when the communards, they were called, were defeated, the capitalists lined them all up and, and shot them. And so one thing that the communards did as they were facing the firing squads is they raised their fists up in the air. And so then their, their bodies would be dumped into these shallow graves. And then their executioners looked on in horror when their fists popped up out of the ground. That's why I'm very happy that our organization, my, my organization that I'm part of, Fight Imperialism Stand Together, we call ourselves FIST. You know, the FIST is a symbol, uh, it's a symbol of the undefeatability of the human spirit and that the battle for freedom will continue no matter how much repression is rained down on us. Um, now, the Paris Commune was tremendous, but it was not the greatest achievement of this period. By far, the most important victory uh, in the first era of communist revolutions was the overturning of slavery in the United States. Though it's been buried, and I'm sure you didn't learn about it in your high school history class or he even here in college, communists 
played a very important role in that struggle. We've been taught to call it the Civil War, but what took place in the United States in the 1860s was really the Second American Revolution. During the war, Karl Marx was employed by the New York City Republican Party anti-slavery newspaper called the New York Tribune. Uh, key leaders of the Union Army, including a brigadier general named August Willick, uh, closely consulted with Karl Marx. Joseph Wedemeyer, a former leader of the German Communist League, uh, he regularly consulted with Karl Marx, and he was a leader of the Union Army in St. Louis, Missouri. In Ohio, German Americans who were part of the Communist League formed the Ohio 9th Infantry, also called Die Neuner. And this was a communist division of the Union Army that actually marched into battle singing revolutionary songs and had the red flag as their official emblem. The trade unions were very key in mobilizing white workers in the North to fight against slavery. And Lincoln was actually forced to recognize the important role that communists played in the struggle against slavery. Uh, when, when Karl Marx endorsed, formally endorsed Abraham Lincoln in the elections, uh, Lincoln's secretary sent him a letter thanking him for the support of the International Workers Association. Uh, tell that to some of the people who run the Republican Party today. <laughs> uh, but one of the primary factors in the Civil War, and this is also left out, is the role played by the slaves themselves. Now, we all learn about Harriet Tubman leading the Underground Railroad, but we also don't know, and most of us aren't taught in school, that Harriet Tubman was also the first woman ever to lead U.S. soldiers into battle. She led a guerrilla army across South Carolina, liberating slaves, putting guns into black people's hands to fight the slave plantation owners. Slaves throughout the South joined the Union Army and formed armed groups of their own as well, as like guerrilla groups to fight the slave owners. At the beginning of the war, Lincoln and the northern industrial capitalists didn't want to abolish slavery. They only wanted to stop it from expanding into the western states. It was the labor unions, the abolitionists, and most importantly, the revolts of the slaves themselves that forced the Emancipation Proclamation and the eventual full abolition of slavery. As much as the Union Army and Lincoln tried to say the war was not about slavery, it was. The Second American Revolution changed history like nothing else. The U.S. Civil War was just part of a wave of uprisings that took place during this period. Colonized people around the world rose up. Karl Marx's daughter devoted her life to the armed struggle of the Irish people for independence from the British Empire. History marched forward at a very rapid pace in the 1840s, 50s, 60s, and 70s. Socialist parties were formed all over the world, and talk of revolution and anti-capitalism was very widespread. However, this first wave of conscious resistance, the first era of the world communist movement, began to decline in the 1890s. Why? Well, the answer is one word, imperialism. The capitalists of Europe and, and the United States began to expand on a global level. Bankers began to dom dominate, the, dan I'm sorry, excuse me, bankers began to play the dominant role, and industrial capitalists were absorbed into monopolies. The governments of the United States and Europe stopped functioning merely as defenders of capitalist private property, but actually merged with the capitalists, forming the, the corporate imperialist states that we have today. This period was the rise of stock markets. As capitalism expanded on a global level, Bankers started making super profits, and they were able to divide the working class. The working class in Europe and the United States, the homelands of empire, was divided. Some of the workers were skilled workers. They worked in skilled jobs, and they had higher wages. Other workers, especially in Britain, were sent to Africa and Asia to act as settlers or overseers and bosses, kind of beating down the indigenous people. Cecil Rhodes was the British imperialist who oversaw the colonization of certain parts of Africa. Zimbabwe, before, before its revolution, its anti-colonial revolution in the 1980s, was actually called Rhodesia, named after Cecil Rhodes. And he actually laid it out. He stated this. He said, I was in the east end of London, a working class quarter yesterday, and I attended a meeting of the unemployed. And I listened to their wild speeches, and they were all just a cry for bread, bread, bread. And on my way home, I pondered over the scene, and I became ever more convinced of the importance of imperialism. The empire, as I have always said, is a bread and butter issue. If you want to avoid civil war, you must become imperialists. Dividing the working class, creating a strata of workers who sympathize with their bosses and look down on other workers, more oppressed workers, was a successful way of halting revolutionary activism. This group of workers had privilege in relation to other workers, and they were called the aristocracy of labor. The big bankers were able to mobilize these workers to fight for their profits around the world and beat down the rest of the workers, both at home and around the world. As millionaire capitalist Jay Gould in the United States put it, I can hire half the working class to shoot the other half. That's, actually, that's a direct quote. This guy actually said that. 
Now, in the United States, the rise of imperialism coincided with the rise of, and, and, uh, with a vicious rise of racism. The Ku Klux Klan was formed among former Confederate soldiers to attack formerly freed slaves. The Union Army was pulled out of the Confederate states. Formerly enslaved black workers who'd been running for office and voting and establishing their own businesses were smashed. Jim Crow segregation came into existence, and the hope for equality for African Americans that had come out of the Civil War, the Second American Revolution, was squashed. Why did the Union Army pull out of the South and hand it over to Jim Crow and the racist plantation owners? Because mobilizing white workers to attack, lynch, and terrorize black workers was a necessary part of maintaining capitalist order in the United States. White workers in the U.S. were taught to think of themselves not as workers, but as whites. As immigrants from Ireland and Eastern Europe poured into the country, the bosses also promoted hatred for them. It was anti-Catholic bigotry, hatred for Catholics. That was a big thing at that time. The Spanish-American War, followed by a lengthy U.S. war against the people of the Philippines, was the way the U.S. imperialists emerged as a power on the global markets. And as imperialism was an ascendancy, the working class was divided. Many revolutionary organizations that had sprung up during this, this earlier period, they became reformist. Uh, workers in general didn't fight back as much because they saw their lives getting slightly better as imperialism was in, in, ascend in ascendancy. Hostile circumstances tend to push forward revisionist and reformist elements in the revolutionary movement. The most prominent Marxist in the, uh, in the United States at that time was a man named Samuel Gompers. And Samuel Gompers, he, in response to the ascendancy of imperialism, moved in a right-wing direction. He took the American Federation of Labor, the big union federation, he, he took them into a, a right-wing, uh, they call it business unionism, you know, there's no politics, endorse capitalist politicians, don't, don't talk about working class power. Uh, another group called the Socialist Labor Party, which was very big at that time, it actually kind of degenerated into kind of an ultra-left sect, a kind of a cult of personality around their leader, who was a guy named Daniel DeLeon. Uh, you know, at that time, they put out a pamphlet called Trade Unions or Socialism. You know, I'm for both, personally, but, you know, you know it was kind of an ultra-left thing. And in addition, one, one thing that happens in periods of reaction is that people, people get desperate and resort to acts of adventurous, you know, isolated acts of violence or adventurism. It's where people kind of feel that they can't, you know, effectively lead a mass movement, and so they resort to kind of doing exciting, violent things that really don't achieve all that much. Uh, the biggest example of that was during this period, U.S. President McKinley was assassinated by an anarchist in Buffalo. Uh, the anarchist uh, pointed a gun at him and said, this is for the working class and the peoples of the Philippines, Mr. President, and blew him away. You know, but again, did that achieve anything? Not really. The president died, but imperialism stayed intact. You know, the change doesn't come through isolated acts of adventurism. It comes through building a mass workers' movement. But in this period, it was very hard to do because imperialism was an ascendancy. At the dawn of the 20th century, it seemed like communism was dead. The expansion of imperialism had pushed the working class back. However, after capitalism moved into its imperialist stage, it soon found itself in a crisis once again. In order to make more money, the capitalists always have to develop technology. The better their machines are, the fewer workers they need to hire, the more profits they make. The capitalists are always driving to pay the workers as few as possible, as, to hire as few workers as possible and pay them as little as possible and drive them to produce as much as, as they possibly can while paying them less and less. The result is that soon the market is glutted with products that can't be sold. Why? Workers are also consumers. As their wages go down, fewer of them are hired, their ability to purchase uh, becomes, goes down and you have a, a crisis. The Industrial Revolution spawned many amazing inventions, electric lights, steam engines, automobiles, you name it. As capitalist technology advanced, soon came an economic collapse. In the early years of the 1900s, they had a depression almost every few years, and they would call them panics. Workers would be thrown out on the street and starve. Poverty became more and more widespread. Immigrants in urban centers of the United States found themselves exploited horrendously alongside black workers who fled to the north to escape Jim Crow segregation. Millions of families in the United States were forced to send their children at the age of eight or nine to work just so they could make ends meet. In the steel mills, garment factories, meat packing houses, workers barely got enough to survive, about the same as what fast food workers make today. The rise of unemployment across the United States and Europe, as well as the extreme decline in workers' wages, saw a gradual revival of revolutionary ideas. All across the world, communist ideas suddenly started to become popular again as capitalism became less and less tolerable. 
During this time, Eugene Debs became one of the most well-loved people in the United States. He had a red train car, and he would go from town to town giving speeches about the evils of capitalism and the need to overthrow capitalism. He ran, he ran for president numerous times, even from a jail cell. He ran for president, bringing a socialist message. The major imperialist powers of Europe became so desperate for control of the markets as the economic crisis got worse, they were forced to go to war against each other to preserve their profits. Now, many of the so-called socialist parties were led by sell-out reformist leaders, and they supported the war. However, a few revolutionary parties around the world uh, stuck to their principles and opposed, opposed the war and stood firm against it. And one of those parties was the Bolshevik Party in Russia. Led by the organizational brilliance of Lenin, in 1917, the workers turned their guns around. They overthrew the Tsar, and a few months later, they overthrew capitalism altogether. There were workers' revolts all across Europe at the end of World War I, but only in Russia did the workers hold on to power. Soviets, or workers' councils, laid the basis for a new kind of government. The Bolsheviks, who eventually became the Communist Party of the Soviet Union, were faced with an extremely dis difficult task. They had taken power, but were surrounded by capitalism and had to function as part of the world capitalist economy. The revolution that they'd expected to happen in Germany never happened. The Soviet Union was invaded by many countries. It faced an economic blockade. Yet in spite of that, miracles took place. The Soviet Union was the first socialist society, and it was, and it was a, the first time in history that we've seen an economy that wasn't held back by the inefficiency and straight-up stupidity of capitalism. In 1928, when Joseph Stalin led the country to launch the five-year plans, the Soviet Union went from being an agrarian third world country to being a world industrial power. In a few short years, the Soviet Union produced more tractors than any, any other country on earth. It erected steel mills that produced more steel than any other country on earth. The barren countrysides where peasants had lived in huts was replaced with modern industrial cities with huge skyscrapers. The socialist system in the Soviet Union provided every person with housing, electricity, running water. Illiteracy was wiped out. Hundreds of new universities and thousands of new, new hospitals were constructed. In a new society led by communists, every person was guaranteed a job until they retired at the age of 60 with a guaranteed income for the rest of their life. The Soviet Union constructed the world's, first, or the world's largest hydroelectrical power plant. It was called the Dnieper Dam in Ukraine. Now, one woman who worked at this, this factory, was, and her name was Tatiana Fedorova, and she was interviewed for a PBS documentary that came out in, I think, 1996 or 97. And she described it this way, and these are her words, not mine. She says, it was, something, it was like something out of a fairy tale. This was a country where people had lived in virtual darkness. They were illiterate. They wore birch bark shoes. How is it possible to raise such great construction sites? It was only possible through the unity of the people and the love of the people for their idol, Comrade Joseph Stalin. Even Leon Trotsky, Stalin's greatest opponent, marveled at what took place during this, the period of the construction of socialism in the USSR. He declared, quote, socialism has demonstrated its right to victory, not on the pages of Das Kapital, but in an industrial arena composing a sixth of the Earth's surface, not in the language of dialectics, but in the language of steel, cement, and electricity. A proletarian revolution in a backward country has achieved, less in ten, has achieved in less than 10 years successes unexampled by history. The Soviet Union was invaded by the Nazis in 1941, and 26 million Soviet people died fighting Hitler. In 1945, Soviet troops tore down the walls of Auschwitz, freed the concentration camp victims, and hung a hammer and sickle flag over Berlin. After the war, the Soviet Union even launched the world's first spacecraft, Sputnik. Later, the first person to enter outer space, Yuri Gagarin, was a Soviet citizen. Since 1928, when the Soviet Union launched the five-year plans, there has been absolutely no question that socialism is more efficient than capitalism. Anyone who tells you communism doesn't look good, I mean, we've all heard it. Communism looks good on paper. It just doesn't work in practice. <laughs> communism is a good idea. Anyone who tells you that, they either just don't know any better, they're repeating what they've heard, or they're lying to you. An economy under the control of the people can be very successful. Even today, as Russia is a rising force on the world economy, it's that way because of what was achieved by socialism. All the steel mills, oil wells, trains, and skyscrapers in modern Russia uh, are constructed an economy based on what was built during the period of the Soviet Union. Now, because the Soviet Union was surrounded by capitalism and endured so much hardship, its political character gradually deteriorated. Especially after the death of Stalin, right-wing factions in the Communist Party gained a lot of power. Because the Soviet Union was under constant siege and attack by the imperialists, like other socialist countries, it didn't have the luxury of being the free and open society that many of its citizens probably would have preferred. The Soviet Union was a gigantic fortress 
of resistance to imperialism. It was a huge stretch of liberated territory and a global class war. The Soviet Union was not the ideal model. It's not a blueprint for the future socialist world. It was a stronghold of working class power, swimming upstream in a hostile river of capitalism, constantly under attack, struggling to hold on to the victories that had been won in the October Revolution. The impact of the Soviet Union spread well beyond its own borders. After the Russian Revolution, Lenin formed the Communist International, and this was a global organization of communists who coordinated their actions in Moscow. A strong communist party was formed in almost every country in the world. The United States, just like the rest of the world, was irreversibly changed by the Soviet Union. Uh, during the Great Depression, the Communist Party, which was aligned with the Soviet Union, and yes, even funded by the Soviet Union, uh, they organized these things called unemployment councils. And when a family would get kicked out of their house by their landlord or they couldn't pay their mortgage, uh, the unemployment council would come and they would break the locks and put the family back in. In the industrial factories around this country, in the auto plants and the steel mills, when workers would get laid off, uh, the Communist Party would organize them to, to have sit-down strikes, and they would take over, they'd sit in, they'd occupy the, the factory and refuse to leave until the bosses met their demands. You know, Every worker in this country, no matter how right-wing and confused they are, has greatly benefited and owes a whole bunch to the Communist Party and to the Soviet Union. Communists won them their weekends off, their eight-hour workday, their higher wages, and their union rights. The Soviet Union understood, and this is probably their most important contribution, the Soviet Union understood that one of the most ugly aspects of U.S. society is racism. And if there was ever going to be any change in the United States, they had, there had to be a huge battle against racism. And before Martin Luther King Jr. was even born, the Communist Party was organizing right-to-vote clubs in the South. The Communists formed the, the National Negro Labor Congress and attempted to build alliances of black freedom fighters. The Communists defended the Scottsboro Nine, a group of young African-American men who were falsely accused of rape. Almost every great black freedom fighter and intellectual of the 1930s was somehow connected to the Communist Party. Paul Robeson, Claudia Jones, Richard Wright, Langston Hughes, W.E.B. Du Bois, they were all members of the Communist Party. I understand today is actually Paul Robeson's birthday and that he went here to Rutgers. Mm -hmm. So yeah. Yeah. I, I'm, that's like an honor, and let's applaud Paul Robeson. I mean, you want to talk... You know, Paul Robeson refused to cower. They, they called him for the House Un-American Activities Committee. They said, are you a, an ally of the Soviet Union? And he gave nothing but an absolute defense of socialism and, and its solidarity with the black freedom struggle. And, you know, I, before I go, I, I actually want to, like, take a picture. If we could all take a picture next to the big picture of Paul Robeson because if people actually knew who he was, you know, they would be, they would be really blown away because I think he, he made a dynamic contribution. Yeah. Now, though the Soviet Union's leaders grew more conservative, especially after the death of Stalin, after the Second World War, a wave of nationalist, anti-imperialist, and communist revolutions swept the planet. Increasingly, the right-wing Soviet leaders may have, uh, increasingly, even though the right-wing Soviet leaders may have tried to hold it back, the very existence of socialism enabled a huge upsurge of colonized and super-exploited peoples in, in revolt and fighting back against imperialism. In 1949, China shook the world with a socialist revolution. Cuba had a revolution in 1959 that eventually took the socialist road. The Democratic People's Republic of Korea came into existence. Throughout the 60s, 70s, and 80s, communist revolutions took place in many countries. Ethiopia, southern Yemen, Afghanistan, Nicaragua, Angola, Namibia, Grenada, all had communist parties seize control. These revolutions greatly benefited the people. They allowed the people to build up their economies outside of the imperialist system. Before the 1949 revolution, China had no steel mills. Today, 50% of the world's steel is manufactured in the Chinese government-owned steel industry. That's a huge, huge achievement. Uh, the life expectancy in people of, of people in China has doubled, and illiteracy has been wiped out. Cubans have the highest life expectancy in all of Latin America with universal housing and zero unemployment. Cuba, a tiny island led by a communist party, provides more medical aid around the world than any other country in the world. According to the CIA World Factbook, again, you know, I like to use their statistics against them. You know, it's funny because the, the imperialists, they have different media. When they're talking about, when they're talking about these things in the media, they, they tell you one thing. But if you look at things like the CIA World Factbook or the UN statistics or the, uh, the State Department, they have the, the, the country studies or the U.S. Library of Congress. This is the stuff they base their decisions on, their military. They want the facts there. They want the truth there. In the media, they tell one thing. But when they're actually trying to, to carry out their strategies, they tend to want to base that on actual reality. 
But uh, according to the CIA World Factbook, the, the highest literacy rate in all of Africa is actually in Zimbabwe, which is a country led by, by ZANU-PF, which is a Marxist-Leninist party that overthrew the colonial apartheid settler state of, of Rhodesia. And uh, as much as the, the imperialists uh, wouldn't let you know it, Nelson Mandela was actually a member of the Central Committee of the South African Communist Party. It was the U.S. government that called the African National Congress terrorists but the Soviet Union gave millions of dollars to the people of South Africa to fight against apartheid. The wave of third world revolutions that swept the planet was made possible by the existence of the Soviet Union. Soviet money, Soviet guns, but more importantly, Soviet hospitals and doctors, Soviet trade enabled countries around the world to break free from the chains of imperialism. And not all of these countries necessarily were socialist. Uh, the Soviet Union also supported the Egyptian revolution led by General Abdel Nasser, supported Libya under Gaddafi. There was a, a, just a wave of anti-imperialist, anti-colonial revolutions. Now, and this wave of third world revolutions following the Second World War also had an impact within the United States. Uh, Robert F. Williams was a leader of the NAACP in North Carolina, and he got into a shootout with the Ku Klux Klan. So where did he flee? He fled to Cuba. And from Cuba, he had a radio broadcast uh, show called Radio Free Dixie, in which he urged black people in the United States to take up arms against racism and, and imperialism. Uh, and the Black Panther Party of the United States was really the, probably the most concrete expression of the wave of third world anti-imperialist revolutions that, uh, around the world. It was probably the most concrete expression of it here in the United States. On the college campuses, Students for a Democratic Society became a militant organization with at least a, at least a million members. And by the late 60s, uh, Marxist-Leninist politics was very widespread in the United States. There was a huge upsurge of activism against racism, against the Vietnam War. Now, the only political party that consistently aligned with the, the wave of third world revolutions was Workers' World Party, which I'm proud to say that I'm a member of. Workers' World Party built a dynamic youth group during this period called Youth Against War and Fascism, or YOF, which was known as like a street fighting revolutionary group. Uh, whenever any leader of a fascist group would speak, they would shut them down. They would actually, I've heard stories from my older comrades, they talk about coming to demonstrations with hard hats on, expecting the cops to come down on them. It's a very militant group. Uh, you know, and, and Workers' World Party came out of that period and became a, a large organization during that period, and it grew mainly because it recognized that the Soviet Union was led by bureaucratic revisionists, but that the economic foundations of the Soviet Union were still socialist. And then, and today, Workers' World Party worked to build solidarity between the workers of the United States and the people around the world that were fighting for their national liberation and their independence. Basically, the message was that people in the United States, they shouldn't sympathize with their government and their bosses. They should instead sympathize with the people in Africa, Asia, and Latin America who are fighting for their independence, that Wall Street is screwing both of us, and it's time we join together and fight. That's by the name Workers' World Party. Um, and the party also made a point of promoting the leadership of the most oppressed sections of U.S. society uh, and seeing them as key as bringing about world revolution. Now, the response of the capitalists to the rise of the third world against empire, based on support of the Soviet Union and, and the Chinese Revolution as well, was vicious attack. Four million people were killed in Korea. Five million were killed in Vietnam. 58,000 young workers from the United States were sent to die in Vietnam as the capitalists attempted to keep it under their control. Cuba was subjected to an economic blockade and numerous attacks on it with chemical and biological weapons. People's Korea remains under military siege with thousands of U.S. troops lined up on its border. From 1945 onward, the United States threatened the Soviet Union with nuclear destruction. The capitalists are so twisted that they would rather blow up the world than let the workers like us run it. When the Soviet Union and China became enemies in 1961, the leaders of China and, the, and later in the 70s when the leaders of China became friendlier to the United States, this had a huge impact on weakening the world revolutionary movement. In African countries, China-supported China groups began to align with the United States against Soviet-supported groups, and this was horrific. I mean, it was a huge setback. The campaign of imperialist violence and encirclement took its toll on the world revolutionary movement. In the 1980s, for the first time in history, the Soviet Union actually had an economic setback. The first time in their history, but it happened. The setback was mainly due to the fact that they were forced to spend so much money on military defense, developing nuclear weapons to, to, so they could respond and they could prevent the U.S. from having the first strike capability. Now, the pressure of U.S. imperialism, as well as the political weaknesses of the Soviet Union's leaders, eventually led to the collapse of the Soviet Union. After the collapse of the Soviet Union, the, the capitalist press, they always say, well, that proves that socialism failed. Well, no, that's not what was proven by the collapse of the Soviet Union. 
The, Soviet Union, the collapse of the Soviet Union didn't prove that socialism failed. It proved that socialism fails when it's led by anti-communists. Anyone who thinks Mikhail Gorbachev was a genuine communist is delusional. <laughs> Gorbachev embraced Ronald Reagan. He rejected the concept of class struggle. And he actually privatized industries and sold them to U.S. banks. The collapse of the Soviet Union was a result of endless pressure being placed on the Soviet Union by imperialism, which strengthened the right-wing and revisionist leaders. It took decades for the great society built up by Lenin and the Bolshevik leaders to finally be torn down. The world communist movement has been significantly weakened since 1991. The second era of communist revolution reached its conclusion as the Soviet Union was destroyed and China moved in a right-wing direction. People's Korea and Cuba, and at, during this time, People's Korea and Cuba faced probably the most difficult time in their history. You know, in, in Cuba, they call it the special period. In, in People's Korea, they call it the arduous march. I mean, these countries, I mean, they, they, they barely held on. I mean, they were really, the fact that they lost such a huge trading partner and they were surrounded, it was, it was it's a miracle that both of those countries still remain under the control of, of Marxist-Leninist parties. The opening up of China to foreign investment, the overthrow of the Soviet Union and socialism throughout Eastern Europe, as well as the technological revolution in the 1990s, placed imperialism into ascendancy once again. But remember last time? Remember when imperialism was in ascendancy? What was that about? The capitalists, they may have been able to rain death and horrendous destruction on the socialist countries of the world. They may be able to develop technology to make production cheaper than ever, pay workers as little as possible, uh, hire as few as possible, uh, make as much profit. But the one thing that they cannot do is make their system work. Remember the problem of overproduction. Well, the computer revolution of the 1990s proved that Marx was correct. Computer technology advanced, techno advanced production to as astronomical levels. Capitalists can produce goods more efficiently than ever before, with fewer workers than ever before. I know there used to be book binderies, you know, where, where hundreds of workers would be employed binding books all day. Now they have a machine, you know, Amazon create a page where you push a button, you, you put it in the computer, and it just comes out, right? So based on that, there are much fewer jobs. Fewer, fewer people are hired in industrial production. Uh, you know, steel mills once required thousands of workers, but now can function with just a few hundred. And as workers on a global scale are reduced to lower wages than ever, facing higher rates of unemployment, the capitalist market is once again glutted with unsellable commodities. The low-wage disaster facing the global working class is leading toward a financial collapse. Workers are also consumers, and as they become massively impoverished, the whole system grinds to a halt. The financial crisis of 2008-2009 was tiny in comparison to the capitalist crisis that is looming ahead on the horizon. The only way that the problem of capitalism, this problem of production, you know, overproduction and production essentially not being planned, it's just run about how a capitalist can make profit, the only way that it can ever really be resolved is for the, the means of production to become the common property of the workers. The banks, the factories, the industry must be seized by the working class and operated for social good, not for profits. And the working class is beginning to fight back once again. In Europe, a mass anti-austerity movement is taking place with strikes, student rebellions, and other fights. The year of 2011 will be remembered as a turning point in U.S. history. Workers in Wisconsin occupied the state capitol defending union rights. The workers seized in anger at the racist execution of Troy Davis, and later that year, Occupy Wall Street shook the country as young people everywhere began chanting anti-capitalist slogans about the 99% and going into the streets and fighting the cops. Since 2011, there's been a surge of anti-racist rebellions against police brutality and racism. Uh, there was a mass protest. The mass protests that followed the death of Trayvon Martin were nothing compared to the Black Lives Matter upsurge we saw uh, of earlier this year and, and of the last years of uh, last months of 2014. Armed struggle against the police actually broke out in Ferguson, Missouri. And all around the world, the working class still holds power in, in Korea, Cuba, Vietnam, Laos, and China. And almost all of Latin America is under the control of revolutionary anti-capitalists who aspire to move their countries uh, closer to socialism. They may not be there yet, but they're trying to move in that direction. They're studying Marx and Lenin. In Venezuela, they're actually building up people's militias. They can't trust the militias of the capitalist government, so they're building up the Bolivarian militias. You know, there's over 125,000 young communists in Venezuela who are armed to protect the Bolivarian process. In East Ukraine, a communist-led coalition led by the People's Republic of Donetsk and Luhansk uh, has taken power. And actually, the government, the puppet government of the United States in, in Western Ukraine, the Kiev junta, just yesterday, they, they officially passed a law banning not the Communist Party, which was already banned, but banning the ideology of communism. <laughs> no, I, I, you can't make this up. They banned the ideology. I'd like to know how the... 
how, how do these people, how do you ban an ideology? I want to go there with, with like a Bible and be like, you know, so where, where Jesus here says, feed the poor and the last shall be first, is this illegal? Are you going to arrest me for having that? You know, I mean, how do you ban an ideology? But if communism were dead, they wouldn't have to ban it now, would they? Now, uh, you know, communist militias are currently fighting in Syria alongside the Syrian Arab army, and they're battling against U.S.-backed insurgent terrorists that are trying to overthrow the Syrian government, as well as against ISIS. I believe we are now at the very earliest stages of the third era of communist revolutions. Revolts are breaking out all the time, and the oppressed are once again battling against the oppressors everywhere. It is our responsibility to make this resistance conscious resistance. Only communists can offer the leadership and the ideology that can point toward the overthrow of the old system. Our task is to show young people who are angry about student debt, angry about barely being able to get by in a low-wage economy, and filled with rage at the escalation of police terror and the stripping away of civil liberties, that they have allies. All the people in Africa, Asia, Latin America, and the Middle East who are battling the US imperialists are our friends. The same bankers and military police state that is destroying the future of the United States is also waging war against the world. As revolts sweep the planet, forces armed with Marxist-Leninist Marxist ideology can and must push forward a revolutionary message, explaining that the current world, why it is, and pointing toward the, the path to an entirely new one. What is missing in all of the tremendous outpourings taking place now against austerity, low wages, racism, and police repression is straight up anti-capitalist agitation. And we, me and several other revolutionary organizations, we intend to do something about it. And coming up on Sunday, we're actually holding a meeting called Why Fight the System? And we're inviting leaders of various revolutionary anti-capitalist groups. Uh, we're inviting uh, leaders of the immigrant workers and their struggle in solidarity with Mexico. We're inviting leaders of Cop Watch, a group that, that follows the police. Um, uh, we, we're in, uh, involved. We have a, an anarchist playwright is going to speak, different sectors of the movement. And we're going to call, uh, hopefully in June, a march against capitalism on Wall Street. right? And we're going to raise the red flag on Wall Street, the center of the world capitalist economy that is destroying the world. And we're going to be there with all different tendencies, anarchists, social democrats, Hoxists, Stalinists, Trotskyites, Maoists, whatever you are, you got to be there. Because what is needed desperately right now is people to just say what the problem is. The problem is capitalism. Oh, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> thanks. <laughs> Where is this meeting Sunday? Uh, it's at Sunday. It's in New York City at our office at the Solidarity Center. It's taking place. Um, we're hoping to build a march. And I hope that maybe, maybe your club can build a contingent at this march you know, and, and be part of the planning of it and all of that. I think that would be tremendous. Because I'm going to be in New York over the weekend. Yeah, it'll, be, uh, it'll be in Chelsea on 23rd Street, uh, 24th Street. The address is 147 West 24th Street. The Facebook event, I think I can post it to your page and, and send it out to everyone here. Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. What, what time do we show up there? At 2, 2 p.m. 2 p.m. will be the meeting. Cool. Not everyone can be a communist. Marx and Lenin and some other revolutionary leaders were very clear about this. It's only a small percentage of people who are ready to give their entire lives to the struggle. You know, you, you, you've got to think back. Now, nowadays, a lot of parents talk about telling their children what slavery was and having to explain about this barbaric practice of humans owning other humans. I believe that in a future socialist United States, parents will be having to explain to their children what poverty was and how people were allowed to go hungry or sleep on the street. I think that's the direction that we're headed in. But the reason that they're going to be able to tell them that is going to be because of the efforts of millions of self-sacrificing people. As we stand with the, mass, with the masses of oppressed people and the working class, our, must, our message must be that our enemy is not in Iran, it's not in Cuba, it's not in Venezuela, it's not in Russia or China, it's on Wall Street. And if the billionaires in this country want to start a war and they want us to go and fight against Russia or China, and that's not a war they're going to be able to fight with drones, mind you. That's a war that's going to involve a lot of young people being handed guns, young people making low wages, living in a police state, then being told that they have to go and kill people for Wall Street. And when that happens, I'm confident that there's going to be a strong revolutionary organization in this country that is going to say to them, turn your guns around. You want us to fight for democracy? We'll fight for it right here. We're going to get rid of the dictators and the billionaires that run this country on Wall Street, and we're going to fight for a society where the people are in, troll, are in control. The on only socialist revolution can smash the low-wage police state. So let's fight for communism in our time. Thank you. Wow.